Someone asked me, do any of your family suffer from mental illness? And I said, no, I think they rather enjoy it. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of the, the time I've had the past few days, <clears throat> I do continue to be very thankful and to lift up my prayers of thanks for you, for your encouragement, your cards, your concerns, and all of those things that you've done to support us during this time. Last week, I don't see him, but uh, I'm sure someone will tell him about it anyway. Last week, Brother Lonnie got ready for our dismissal prayer, and he made his way up onto the podium here, and uh, uh, it was a bit of a struggle. We could tell it was a bit of a struggle, uh, but he explained that he intended to, as long as he could, to continue walking the way he always walked. And then he suggested that maybe I should preach a sermon about stubbornness. My first thought was, I'm not going to do it and you can't make me. <laughs> My second thought was, would I be for it or against it? And my third thought, although this is not really about stubbornness, it's just one of the things we're going to hit here, but my third thought was, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. I find when I look at Scripture that primarily I'm for stubbornness. Not... Jeremiah 6, stubbornness, you know, when he told them to ask for the old paths and seek the good way and walk therein, and they said, we will not walk therein. And then in verse 17, he said, I set a watchman over you and told you to hearken to the trumpet when he blew it, and you said, we will not hearken. Not that kind of stubbornness, not the kind of stubbornness that... that uh, Stephen preached about in Acts chapter 7 when he said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so also do ye. Not that kind of stubbornness. But I think of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah walking in the flames of that furnace because they refused to bow down to the golden image. I think of Daniel refusing to change his prayer schedule just because the king had made it illegal to pray. There's stubbornness. I think of Moses who refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. This is true, glorious stubbornness. And it fits well with the sermon that I want to preach to you today. Am I godly? Am I spiritual? We're not going to be unless we develop a certain level of stubbornness. And this is what we want to look at today. Turn your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 3. We need to define what these terms mean, and I think that possibly the first four verses here of Colossians 3 might help us to understand godliness and spirituality even though those words don't actually occur in these verses. But you see, if we give just a quick definition before we read these, godliness is about who we focus on. Vines defines it as being characterized by a Godward attitude that does that which is well-pleasing to him. It's who we focus on. On the other hand, being spiritual, spirituality, is about what we focus on. And both of these ideas are found in these first four verses here. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. We're focused on Him. We've been raised with Him. 
We're focused on where he is and the things that are important to him. He says in verse 2, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. You see the, the dual nature of this, that it's about who we're focused on and it's about what we're focused on. Godliness is who we're focused on and spirituality is what we're focused on. He says in verse 3, for ye are dead. We sing it, dead to this world, right? Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, that's who we're focused on. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What a marvelous concept here to be focused on Christ and the things of Christ. To be focused on our Savior and not on the things of this world. Spirituality is a focus on spiritual things. What bothers us more is a good question for us to wrestle with and deal with. What are our greater concerns? Are we more concerned about missing our favorite television show or, or missing our daily Bible study? <coughs> Are we more concerned about making money and friends than we are about winning souls for our Lord? Are we more concerned about the direction of the stock market or the condition of this family, this congregation? Are we more concerned about physical health or about spiritual health? Are we more concerned about sporting events than we are spiritual events? Having fun or being righteous? Are we more concerned about getting along with people or about pleasing God? What occupies us and interests us the most? What gives us the most enjoyment in this world? In our lives. Let's break this down. Let's talk first about spirituality. Turn your Bibles, please, to Galatians chapter 5 that was already read for us. In Galatians chapter 5, we have a section here that explains what it means for us to be spiritual. Four things here. First of all, being spiritual has to do with our direction. In verses 16 through 18, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Where are you going? Where are you walking? What is your direction in this world? He explains that the flesh lusts against the, against the Spirit, that these are incompatible things. They're contrary one to the other, and you can't, as long as you're fleshly, you cannot do the things that you would. But... In verse 18, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, Paul was always careful about this. Read in his writings. Read in the book of Romans. Read here in Galatians. And, and by the way, these are parallel thoughts in many ways. But he was always careful when he told people you're not under the law anymore to clarify and remind them you're still under a law to God. That doesn't mean you can run wild. That doesn't mean you can do what you want to do. You need to be spiritual people. He says, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. And then he goes on to remind them of the distance that they should have from evil. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. He begins with four words that have to do with Sexuality, sexual sins, fornication and uncleanness and lasciviousness and adultery. And then he talks about idolatry. We, talk, we preached about this just recently, that covetousness that places anything except God on the throne. That is number one in our lives. Anything except God is idolatry and witchcraft and hatred. And he deals with many words here that have to do with our relationships with one another. But what he's saying is, if you're going to be spiritual, you need to not have these things in your life. You need to be distancing yourself from these things. Doing away with these things in your life. And then he talks about development. 
Michael brought this out. In addition to pointing out we're supposed to not have certain things in our lives, that none of us are perfect. But notice in verses 22 and 23, the growth that we can have, the things that we're trying to develop, the things that we're trying to become and do. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And we're supposed to be, as Christian people, developing these things. This is said to us, not because the Spirit comes and does something to us to produce these things, but because we walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. The responsibility of this text is ours to produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's very plain here that he's urging them to do these things and leave these other things out. To develop these things and stay distant from those works of the flesh. So we have direction, we have distance, we have development, and then we have the issue of drive. In verse 24, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. We have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Galatians 2.20, earlier in this very same book, I am crucified with Christ. Many versions have there, I have been crucified with Christ. The, the verb there is actually passive. I have been or I am crucified with Christ. But in other passages like this one, they that are Christ have crucified. It's an action that we do. Crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. In Romans 6 and verse 6, as he says in verse 4, uh, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ uh, were baptized into his death. That's verse 3, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. And verse 13. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We are crucified. We put to death the things of the body. And then going back to Colossians Chapter 3, we read 1 through 4, but verse 5 says, putting the responsibility on us again, mortify, therefore, your members which are on the earth. And he gives us a list there, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Put these things, this is our drive to become more like God, to be more focused on Him, to put away the things of this world, to, to divorce ourselves from them and to come closer and closer to our Savior. This is spirituality, that we walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Well, let's go on then and talk about what it means to be godly people. Well, before we do... This one comes with a warning on the package, and it's more serious than the Surgeon General's warning. Okay, this one is a warning from God. It comes right on the package of godliness. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's the warning, and so we have to ask ourselves, do I really want to be godly? If we don't want to be mocked, if we don't want to lose friends, you know, if we don't want to be thought of as the strange person who brings up Christ in conversation, then we better not be godly. 
Because if we're godly, we're going to do those things and we're going to receive those things and we're going to be mocked and jeered. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But turn your Bibles with me, please, to Titus chapter 2. This is a passage that I think we can break down and see a little more of what it means to be godly people. Galatians 5 helped us with the idea of being spiritual people. Uh, Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11 and going down through the end of the chapter, will help us see a little more of what it means to be godly people. Here he says in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Notice first, there is the element of grace here. The grace of God. That's what prompts us to be godly people. The grace of God, that's what teaches us to be godly people. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Godliness is learned behavior. God in His great, unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor toward man gave us this word, gave us the Bible. He favored us with a plan to save us from our sins. And this unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor teaches us, it instructs us, it chastens us, it calls on us to change our lives. Second Corinthians chapter 5, the love of Christ constraineth us. The grace of God teaches us to be Godly people. It calls on us to be godly people. Again, here in verse 12, we see not only grace, but goodness. That we should deny ungodliness. That we should deny worldly lusts. That we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Godliness is goodness. I know if you ask someone, define what it is to be Godly, they'll say, well, it's to be like God. And that's not a wrong definition. That's not actually the, the meaning of it in Scripture. In, in Scripture, it is that focus on Him that causes us to, to want to do His will and to please Him in all things. But there's no doubt that godliness equates to goodness. If we're not good people, we're not godly. If we don't do good things, we're not godly. If we're not involved in good works to help others. We are not godly people. Godliness is goodness. To be godly is to be better than we used to be because we've been taught that by the grace of God. To be godly is to be kinder to others than we used to be because God was kind toward us. To be godly is to focus more on God and His will than we do on ourselves and our own will, our own desires, the things we want. It is to give up self, selfish ambitions and desires, and to devote ourselves to pleasing God. So we have grace and goodness and glory. Verse 13. We are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Godliness contains and carries the hope of glory. We are not 
dreading the return of our Lord. Not if we're godly. We are looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. We hold it as a blessed hope. We're awaiting it. We're longing for it. We are expecting it and desiring it. He is our great God. He is our Savior. Notice this. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And He's coming back for us. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He's coming back for us. Because He loves us. Because He wants us to be with Him. He's coming back for His godly people. And so I ask you again, this is for you to dwell on and think about. I ask you again, knowing the price, knowing that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, knowing that you have to give up self, that you have to put self to death, knowing what it takes to be godly, do you want to be godly? And it is my prayer that we will all answer with a resounding, shouted, yes, we want to be godly. Above all else, with every fiber of our being, we want to be godly. Looking at Him, devoted to Him, trying to please Him in everything, no matter what it costs, no matter who turns against us, no matter what fiery darts Satan is going to throw at us. Yes, we want to be godly. Yes, I want to be godly, regardless of what persecution I might face. We need to determine to be godly people. Look with me, please, at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 7 and 8. Put it up there in case you're trying to remember to write these down. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. But refuse profane and old wise fables. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now notice it. Most people don't really like exercise all that much. <laughs> you know, it's something we're forced to. Something we have to acknowledge is good for us. But this is, we exercise our. It takes work to be godly people. It doesn't happen to us. We labor at it. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness... Because bodily exercise profiteth little. He's not saying it's wrong to get on the treadmill. He's not saying there's no profit in it. He's saying comparatively speaking. When we look at this physical world and we look at eternity, bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable in all things. It's profitable now in this life. It's profitable in the world to come. Godliness is profitable in all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. We need to determine to be godly people. Because that helps prepare us for the end. 2 Peter chapter 3 after he emphasizes very plainly, this world is not going to exist forever. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It's all going to go away, folks. Everything you've worked for here in this world, every physical thing you've ever owned, every person physically that you've ever seen, every building you've ever been in, every, everything you've ever made with your hands, everything, it's all going away. And he asked this question, what manner of persons? 
seeing that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting under the coming of the day of God. We're not dreading it. We're longing for it. Because we're devoted to him. We need to be stubbornly. Go back to that word. Lonnie is here. I see him now. We need to, we need to be stubbornly devoted to spiritual things. We need to be stubbornly focused on God and His will. We need to make a determination. And young people, younger people, listen to me especially about this. And by younger, I mean anyone below 65, because that's about where I'm at, almost where I'm at. <clears throat> Determine that your worldview is not going to be shaped by social media. By these little news blurbs that flash across your phone. That's not a proper worldview. That's Satan trying to distort our minds. Determine that daily you will allow your worldview to be shaped by this book. There is a true devotion to the things above, not to the things of this world. There is a true devotion to God. We have to determine it. We have to decide it. And then we have to be stubborn about it. Because Satan's going to put all kinds of roadblocks in the way. He's going to distract us. He's going to discourage us. He's going to drag us down in every way that he can. And we need to be stubborn and say, no, I'm going to keep walking as I've been walking. I'm going to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Am I, are you godly and spiritual? What does your life revolve around? And who does your life revolve around? In his marvelous grace, our Savior has given us a plan whereby we can stop being the children of the devil and start being his own children. We can be adopted into his family, the Lord's church. It happens when we are baptized. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. It happens when we are baptized that we become the children of God. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's some things that have to come first. We have to believe in Jesus. John 8 and verse 24. We have to repent of our sins. Luke 13 and verse 3. We have to confess our faith in Jesus Christ. And then we have to be baptized. And in that act, the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, from this point onward, we should not serve sin. Why? Because now we're trying to be spiritual people. We're focused on spiritual things, not on what we want. Now we're godly people. We're focused on what he wants to do with our lives, what he wants us to become. If you haven't obeyed that plan that God has given us in his great grace, why don't you do that today? Come in a sinner and go out a saint. You can be part of this family. All of us together, children of God, by faith in Christ Jesus. If you're not right with God for some other reason, Change your life. If necessary, make a public confession. We won't reject you. We love you. We want you to be part of us. If you have a need, won't you come as we stand and sing?